Do we really have to do this? Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to show you how not to restore a vintage guitar. This one's quite a story, so grab yourself a snack and settle in for the ride. Make sure you stay to the end. That's where I'll show you the mistakes I made and explain how you can avoid them. It all started last summer. After successfully restoring this beautiful 1950s Gibson, I was contacted by a fellow woodworker who wanted me to see if I could do something with his guitar. The guitar had a serious buzzing problem and had been looked at by several different people. With no one so far being able to find the problem, he sent it to me. I somewhat reluctantly agreed to take on the job. I say reluctantly because I knew I wasn't really that experienced. Nonetheless, he encouraged me to try my hand at it anyway, so I did. That was mistake number one. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Now that's not to say I've never done anything I'm proud of, just that I know I have a lot to learn. I decided to take it on anyway because I thought it would make for an interesting video. I guess you guys can be the judge of that. Trying to be fair and taking my lack of experience into account, I offered to do the job for not much more than cost. If you didn't see my previous video on this guitar, you might want to watch that one first. To sum it up though, I knew it had a loose brace that was the source of the buzz, but try as I might, I just couldn't find it. Here's where I made mistake number two, opting for invasive surgery. Because I couldn't find the loose brace and because there were other issues with the top, I decided the best course of action would be to replace it. After all, that's what I did on the Gibson and that turned out great. The owner of the guitar was completely on board with this plan, so we went ahead with it. If I could tell my past self one thing, it would be to either locate the loose brace or give the guitar back. Still, the guitar's owner seemed like he wanted me to go for broke and try everything I could. He really didn't want it coming back in its current condition, so I set about my work. Now, not everything I did was terrible. Most of the process actually went pretty well. But as you watch this video, look carefully. See if you can spot the moment where it all went wrong. The critical error I made that would come to sabotage the entire project. I purchased a cedar top that was built and then rejected by the Martin Company. It was rejected because it had a small blemish in an area that I wasn't going to use anyway. So it was a great choice. After getting everything lined up along the center line of the guitar, I roughly traced the shape of the body and then cut it out on the bandsaw. Next I carved the braces, keeping two in their original position so they could slot nicely into the original notches. For the area underneath the bridge, I went with a simple fan pattern. I carved a nice little notch here to set the longest brace inside the tail block. When I was sure that the new top was lined up correctly, I clamped things down and traced around the edges with a sharpie. I used my belt sander to take off most of the remaining material. And with that, it was time to glue the top. There's not a lot to say here, just make sure you have enough clamps and no matter how many clamps you think you need, it's probably more. After allowing the top to dry for at least 24 hours, I used a router with a flush trim bit to cut off the rest of the overhang. Switching to a 1.5mm bearing, I routed the new binding channel. At this point, I was feeling pretty good and honestly, things were looking nice. I ran into an interesting situation here. Normally the binding is routed before the neck is attached. That way the router can travel all the way around. In this case, that wasn't possible. Not to worry though. All you need to do is mark out the shape of the binding channel and carefully remove it with an X-Acto knife. With the channel complete, it was time to install the binding. I like to use a rubber band on the waist of the guitar to help keep the binding tight there as I found it can easily work its way loose. I let the glue dry for a couple of days and then scraped and sanded the excess. With the binding complete, I turned my attention to the fretboard. The owner of the guitar wanted to keep the original fretboard as it does have some character. One thing we weren't so keen on were these worn and frankly tiny frets. I heated each fret with a soldering iron to loosen any adhesive that might be under it, and then used a fret puller with a chip guard to carefully remove them. 
I installed the high frets first since they would be difficult to file after the fretboard was glued in place. Next it was time to line up and glue the fretboard. These are the original tuners the guitar came with. They actually fell apart when I removed the strings, so of course they needed to be replaced. After replacing the nut, I set up my favorite DIY tool, the temporary saddle. Now I didn't come up with this idea, but I think it's genius. What it allows you to do is string up the high and low strings of the guitar before you glue the bridge down. That way you can experiment to find the perfect bridge placement and get the best intonation possible. Being satisfied with the bridge placement, I taped around the edges. The tape serves to both mark its position and catch most of the squeeze out from the glue. Since this bridge placement is so critical, I also decided to clamp this straight edge here to serve as a positive stop. It worked pretty well, and I'll probably do that again in the future. After applying the glue, I used these three clamps to snug everything down. By the way, if you do any leather working, strips of scrap leather are great as a cushion between the clamp and the workpiece. If you don't have any scrap leather lying around, you could also cut up an old belt. The last thing to do was install the remaining frets. I found these fit a bit more loosely than the others, so I applied a bit of CA glue before hammering them in place. I'm going to gloss over the whole finishing process, if you'll pardon the pun. To make a long story short, I used Aquacoat as a grain filler, and then finished the whole thing with clear nitrocellulose lacquer. And then the guitar was finished. It was beautiful, and I was proud. Right there is where I honestly wish I could stop. But you read the video title, and you know there's more to this story. Things were uneventful for a while. The gentleman was unable to come and get his guitar right away, so it just hung there on the wall. Then about two months later, I had what can only be described as a very bad day. It all started when I decided to change the battery in my laptop. I got my special screwdrivers and my replacement battery, and got to work. Now I've done this kind of thing before without incident. Today, however, things were different. The adhesive in my MacBook was much stronger than I had anticipated. So strong, in fact, that one of the lithium-ion cells cracked. Realizing I needed to get this thing off my kitchen table, I took it outside. That's when things went horribly wrong. The computer burst into flames. I called for my wife to bring the fire extinguisher, and this is what was left of my once beautiful MacBook. After that, I laid down on the couch, feeling like a royal fool, and then suddenly, a loud thud could be heard from downstairs. When I went to investigate, this is what I found. Somehow, the bridge had come loose from the top. To make matters even worse, the tension from the strings ripped it off with enough force that the corner of the bridge managed to take a small chip right out of the top. It was a disaster. But why did this happen? The cause of death appears to have been this bridge. When I removed the bridge, it didn't come off perfectly clean. I sanded the bottom on a flat surface covered in sandpaper. And when I checked it with a straight edge, it seemed flat to me. Clearly, I was wrong. Upon closer inspection, this bridge is slightly askew. I also think I could have done a better job with the clamps. The central screw-down clamp was very tight, and probably the reason it held for as long as it did. But the cam clamps on either side couldn't be tightened quite as snug, and when you combine that with the lumpy bridge, it's easy to see why this happened. At this point, I felt terrible. I wanted to surrender. I wanted to give the man back his money, buy him a new guitar, and ask for forgiveness. But I knew that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted his guitar in working order. To be clear, I was upfront in communicating it every step of the process, including this one. That's at least one thing I can say I did right. To make a long story short, I did what I should have done before. I ordered a new bridge and installed it. So does this story have a happy ending? Well, yes, it does. A few weeks later, the gentleman came and got his guitar. 
Despite the flaws, he was delighted to see it again. It's something that clearly has a lot of sentimental value for him. Cosmetic issues aside, it sounds and plays great. I didn't accept any payment for the repair, because I strongly believe no one should pay for work that I'm not 100% satisfied with myself. So all in all, how do I feel about it? Well, I don't know. It was a learning experience. On the one hand, it's horrible to make mistakes with someone else's property. Nothing bothers me more. On the other hand, the benefit of experience is that you've made a lot of mistakes and learned from them. It would have been very easy for me to hide this. I could have deleted my previous video and simply not spent the time to write, edit, and shoot this one. But then, this really would have all been for naught. My hope is that by being honest with all of you, this can be at least one mistake you don't have to make yourself. Good luck to all of you, and I'll see you in the next one.